That's what our hope for the film is. We want to show how Jimmy's life became a truly wonderful life as he did just the things that he described the character George Bailey doing. Hi everybody, I'm Cheryl Crisp for Movie Guide and this is Coffee and Conversation with Aaron Burns. You have an exciting project that you just announced. You're bringing James Stewart's life to the big screen and producing a movie called A Truly Wonderful Life. Tell us about it. Of course, everyone knows Jimmy Stewart, the actor who's famous for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and It's a Wonderful Life and, you know, won Oscars and was nominated five times and just, you know, one of America's most beloved actors. And everyone is very familiar with perhaps his most famous film, It's a Wonderful Life. What I didn't know was the backstory of Jimmy Stewart's biography that led into this. And I, I stumbled across, you know, some articles talking about how he was served in World War II. And I thought it was very interesting. But unlike a lot of other famous people who enlisted in World War II, uh, he actually served on the front lines in combat, wound up staying with the military long after and retired as a brigadier general after Vietnam. But what was so fun is the moment when I realized It's a Wonderful Life was the first film he made after his wartime service. So as you start to dig a little deeper, um, the, the character arc in Jimmy's life was so profound and was a story that I just felt compelled to tell. Jimmy was uh, from Pennsylvania. You know, his dad owned a hardware store. His dad was a World War I veteran and, you know, a strong a deacon in their church, the Presbyterian, you know, family. And I grew up with all those things. And uh, Jimmy wound up, was always interested in airplanes and was always interested in, you know, acting and storytelling and things like that. Wound up getting a degree from, uh, you know, a prestigious college uh, in architecture, but things didn't quite work out. It's during the Great Depression for him to do that. So he said, I'm going to try this acting thing winds up uh, getting a contract to move to Hollywood as an actor and quickly rises through the ranks where within a number of years, he's, you know, the leading men, you know, one of the leading men of Hollywood, you know, winning an Academy Award, playing in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And kind of at the height of all of that, he starts to realize that he wants to be more than just a Tinseltown hero. And he starts to, at, at the height of his fame, he has a desire inside himself to, to not just be a fake pretend uh, hero, but to do something more. And a, a lot of it was his upbringing and his relationship with his father and his dad encouraging him, reminding him of, of you know his father's faith and the things that he'd been taught and patriotism and courage and some of these, these ideals. So as Jimmy sees the war clouds on the horizon of everything that, you know, the, the Nazis are doing and, you know, some of his friends are, are killed and different things, he says, I want to serve my country. I want to serve my fellow man. And he leaves Hollywood behind, you know, much to the dismay of his agents and the studio heads and his bosses. And he, he, he enlists as a private in the U.S. Army Air Corps at the time. So... Uh, he'd been a private pilot. He always had a love for airplanes and flying. And he said, I want to earn my wings, as it were, and become a combat pilot. So he does just that and it works his way up um, till he's becomes a squadron commander. Uh, he earns that rank, but he's trapped in uh, the States because he's a famous actor and they have what's called a, a static hold order on his account. Said, so, no, you're not allowed to go overseas. But his leadership and his charisma and his passion wind up winning the day. And he finds a commander who says, we're going to send you over uh, to Germany as a squadron commander in the 445th Bombardment Group. And just before he goes, his dad comes to the airfield to see him off. And Jimmy writes about this um, in, a, in a guidepost article years later. He said his dad hands him a letter and looks in the eye and hugs him and says, Jimmy, I love you. And read this as you go. He slips the letter into his pocket. So on the plane, as he's heading off to combat, he opens the letter and it's a, it's a prayer for Jimmy. And his dad says, I have faith that God will keep you and preserve you and protect you through this war. And here's a copy of Psalm 91. And Jimmy said that he kept that letter from his dad and that he, he believes it was the his father's prayers um, and that scripture that helped him survive the next years of combat that he was to face. So he lands... Um, in England, and the uh, the Eighth Army Air Force had just been wiped out, absolutely devastated in a number of raids, and so they needed all these new recruits and these new guys to really step in and and pick up the slack from what had been going poorly. And Jimmy winds up being a great 
uh, squadron commander because in the air, his skills, his articulation and his ability to lead and, and use the, his Hollywood actor skills were really, really valuable. And of course, you know, everyone knows Jimmy Stewart, the, the kind of everyman character uh, is able to, to get along well with his men and influence the leaders and put all these, these pieces in place. So they start doing really well and they start winning. But the toll that it takes on Jimmy to be a squadron commander, and he's the one who, when they come home from a mission and planes go down, he's the one who's writing the letters home to mom and dad and and, and wife and, and child saying, we lost your father today. We didn't see any shoots as the plane went down over Berlin, you know, and, and those, those kind of things. So I actually, um, Jimmy Stewart's daughter sent me a photograph of this uh, book they have that is the records of the 445th. Um, that Jimmy was able to to take home from the war with him. And on it, I, it's very moving emotionally when you look at it. He he takes notes after every mission that they sent up. And one in February of 1944, he, he stayed home that mission and sent out the planes. And only uh, of the 28 he sent out, 13 didn't come back. And that's 10 men for plane. He says, planes marked with asterisks did not return. And you can just imagine him drawing those 13 asterisks on there and the way he felt as a commander sending these men out. So what we now know is, you know, is, is PTSD. They called it flat cabby back then. Jimmy was really struggling with the weight of these things. And of course the, the war ends and it's time to come back home. But how does he integrate back into civilian life after all that he's done and seen? And how can he go to make fictional pretend movies after the weight of what he's done. Um, so in this pivotal time, the only movie offer that he gets is to be a bomber pilot in Jimmy's war. And he says, guys, I can't do that. So he goes back home to, to Pennsylvania, you know, there with his dad. And then he goes out with, with other, other folks. Um, but nothing's really happening with his career. And he's, he's kind of at this lost and searching moment when his old buddy, Frank Capra calls and says, Hey, I've got a project for you. It's a great, it's going to be a great story. It's a, it's a Christmas movie about a suicidal father and this angel <laughs> is the worst movie pitch you've ever heard. But uh, you know, as, as we'll tell the story, you know, with his father's encouragement and saying, look, Jimmy, you, you serve your country, you served, you know, your fellow man as a patriot and as a, a citizen and a war hero. Now go serve them with the stories that you can tell and, and go encourage the world through this, this film. So he goes out to make, you know, what becomes It's a Wonderful Life. And there's a beautiful moment where Jimmy writes of the, the scene where he's praying um, in Martini's bar that prayer actually became real for him. Uh, and it was the beginning of a transformation in his life. And so you see him healing from the PTSD and you see that the arc of George Bailey's character reflected into the arc of Jimmy himself. And, you know, Jimmy go to, went on to um, marry and be just have a wonderful relationship with his wife for 45 years and, you know, adopted uh, her two sons and had twin daughters of his own. He just became a wonderful husband and father and citizen and really the values that he portrayed on screen in It's a Wonderful Life, in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, you know, in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance is the man who he became. Uh, and so anyway, I just stumbled into that story and was so excited. I said, this is the kind of hero that our country needs to know about today. This is the kind of man that I want my sons and daughters to grow up learning about and so that we can become like him and share his story. So anyway, I'm, I'm excited for an opportunity to work with Kelly Stewart, uh, his daughter, uh, to, to tell the story. Why do you think, Aaron, that this movie from 80 years ago is still resonating with audiences? It is amazing. I just showed it to my kids uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's it's a black and white, you know, old, there's not a bunch of special effects and action sequences and things, but it's so real. It's so human. And I, and if you can, I was just remembering the moment where Jimmy comes home from work after the money was lost. You know, this is at the end of act two, uh, you know, his his uncle had lost the money and everything's going poorly. And his his son comes up to him and is pulling on his shirt and his daughter's playing the piano. And I, I just thought Frank Capra and Jimmy did such a good job communicating the reality of life as a person and the brokenness and frustrations of the world we live in. But the movie doesn't leave you there. The movie is so full of hope and so full of joy. And I feel like that's what continues to resonate for audiences today. We, we're all looking for hope. We're all looking for joy. We're all looking for a greater purpose. 
And Jimmy, uh, in a quote, he summarized the film and he said um, that it's it's just a story about an ordinary man who realizes that going through life, serving your fellow man, you know, in ordinary ways with a faith in God can have a truly wonderful life. And when I, I, I read that quote, I thought, what a beautiful summary of what is in that message for all of us, that as we serve the people around us, as we, you know, however significant we might feel, whether we feel like what we're doing is making a difference or not, as we're faithful to to serve in the little things, you know, through our faith, uh, we can we can have a truly wonderful life in spite of the trials and challenges. And I think that hope that the film communicates is what makes it such a timeless story. And so our goal with with retelling uh, the making of that film and telling Jimmy's life will to be give audiences a taste of that hope and that joy again when they see this film. Aaron, you just wrote a book called Praying with St. Patrick. Why? I, I'm one of 33 million Americans who like to pretend that they're Irish, right? We say, oh, some <laughs> back there are Irish. And, you know, every March 17th, everybody's Irish, right? Uh, <laughs> until just recently, I, uh, a number of years ago, bumped into the letters that Patrick wrote in his auto, his autobiography. And to be honest, I did before that, I didn't really know if Patrick was any more real than Robin Hood or King Arthur, right? He's something with leprechauns and rainbows and green <laughs> beer and parades and things like that. Uh, but when I I bumped into these letters that he wrote, uh, he wasn't a, didn't live recently. He lived, you know, in 400 AD, give or take 1500, 1600 years ago. But his faith and his journey and his venture and his story were so compelling and moving to me. It's something that I wanted to share, you know, with my kids and with the rest of the world. So that birthed uh, the opportunity to write this book. St. Patrick was one of Ireland's most beloved faith figures. What do you want us to know about him? Well, let me just, if you don't mind, just share a quick intro to his biography. So uh, the first thing is, some people don't know is Patrick wasn't actually Irish. He was British. So he's born in Western Britain and probably modern day Wales. Uh, his dad was a deacon. His grandpa was a pastor and they tried to teach him to pray, teach him things of the Lord. And he just really wasn't interested in all that religious stuff. Until at 15 years old, he finds himself kidnapped by Irish pirates, taken across the Irish Sea and enslaved uh, in Ireland. And he spends seven years there, you know, tending sheep and serving serving his masters as the lowest of the low. He talks about all the suffering he went through. But he says it's in that season that he learned to pray. And God brought to mind the things that his father had taught him and worked miraculously in his heart to draw him towards his need for faith in Jesus and his need to have his own life transformed. And so from there, he winds up escaping, which nobody ever comes back from Ireland. Once you're taken by, you know, the pirates, you don't come back. So he comes home and starts to try to integrate back into life, but God stops him and in a vision says, you need to go back and share the love and forgiveness that you've received from me with the people who enslaved you. And that was, it is time. It was a shocking thing to do. Just like our world today, that's, you know, plagued by racism and discrimination and tribalism. In fact, all these, all these things, there was a sense in the church at that day that we're Romans, Christian, civilized, good, pagan, barbarian, bad, you know, they deserve to be where they are. They deserve to be the victims of human trafficking and, you know, the child sacrifice and all these things that are happening. Uh, but Patrick takes the Old Testament, the New Testament, and holds it up to the church of his day. And he says, God loves everybody. God calls us to go and share love and forgiveness with them. So he was one of the first, you know, after the Apostle Paul, one of the first cross-cultural missionaries to take God's love back and share with the people of Ireland. And it it wasn't easy. And you know, he he continues to talk about how he prayed through the seasons of waiting, trying to get back, and then through the trials and tribulations of dealing with the the Druids and just the, the challenges of life in that time. And he's kidnapped again. He's he, People in his church are killed. But through it all, he sees God answering his prayers. And he sees the island of Ireland uh, transformed uh, within his lifetime. And in, in the generations to come, uh, the next 300 years, historians call it the golden age of saints and scholars, where it's Irish men and women of faith who are going and planting schools and churches and hospitals and sharing the love of Jesus with people all over Ireland and then onto the continent of Europe as well. So when I read that story, um, again, it just it was such an encouragement to me. And I felt like he's the kind of guy that um, it perfectly translates to our modern day. And his faith, and he's 400 years 
uh, from Christ. And now here we are 1500 years later, it, it translates straight across the time uh, back and hits us right where we're, we're at today. When filming, you travel with your fi uh, five kids and your wife. How special is that to you? You know, the the film industry for people who maybe don't work in this space can be very, very hard on families because the hours that, that it takes to make a production when you go to set, you're working 14, 15, 16 hours a day over the course of months, you know, usually away from your home base. And it can it can just be devastating cutting off the relationships that you might have with your your wife and your kids and, and your community. So for me, I made a commitment years ago as my wife and I were praying through the different opportunities we had that we want to make sure that we prioritize our family in the midst of our vocation. And that we say God never calls you to disobey him in one area to fulfill his call in another area. And that if he wants us to be filmmakers and to tell these stories that he's given us a passion to tell, then we know that he's going to provide a way for us to do that in a way that honors our first commitment, my first commitment as a husband and a father. So that's been something that it hasn't always been easy. And I would I would just like to honor my wife for her willingness and commitment to coming with me. So when we go to production, if I'm gone for more than a week or so, we'll pack up our kids in an SUV and, and drive out to the location and stay in an Airbnb and you know, we try to make it an adventure for the kids as well. So when we were filming out in, you know, the Rocky Mountains for Legacy Peak or uh, filming in the deserts of Arizona for, for Birthright Outlaw, we try to find things that will keep the kids engaged and have fun with it and join us on the adventure. And, you know, they're joining us and praying about the different stories that we're telling and are there the whole time for it. So it's definitely something that takes intentionality and it takes a gracious and supporting family, uh, but it's something that we feel called to do together. Aaron, in closing, how important are family-friendly films in our world today? I was just scrolling through a news website last night, and I saw negativity, 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 negativity. These people hate this people. This person was cheating here. This person was defrauding this. This nasty perversion of this, that, and the other. And everything we see around us, the growing noise of anger and hatred and division and suffering, it's so loud. It's so loud. It can clamor our souls and lead us to depression and lead us into discouragement. And when we're discouraged, when we focus more on complaining, uh, it can transform our whole view of what of what, who God is and our relationship with him and what he's doing. And I think when you look at someone with George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life, nothing changed between when uh, before he knew what life was like without him and what life was like with him, except a story. And so the angel Clarence takes him through and shows him the things and reminds him of what's true, reminds him of what's lovely and what's beautiful and, and tells him a story. And it completely transformed Jimmy's life. Nothing physically changed, but his mindset changed because of this story that Clarence took him on. And I think for me, the privilege of being a storyteller in our culture today is one that, that I take very seriously. And the privilege of telling stories that can encourage families and hopefully serve for them what Clarence served for George Bailey uh, is something that I feel like is is desperately needed. And I know for me, we uh, we love to watch way more movies than I can make on my own, right? <laughs> the, uh, we would love to watch a movie every week and be, in, be encouraged and have some wonderful content that you can watch with your kids and to create those special times where mom and dad and your kids, you can sit down together and enjoy those films and discuss them and think about them, pray for them um, and, and bring them into your lives. Uh, we're so privileged to get to do that and are grateful for all the other people who are working those things as well. But as you think about it, storytelling is one of the most powerful influences in our lives and helps shape how we think and how we imagine and how we look with hope towards the future. So that's what, that's what our goal is with um, you know, my company Burns & Co. So we have four values. We aspire to tell timeless faith and family adventure stories. So um, we're, we're hopeful that uh, these the films we make will be an encouragement to, to all the families out there. If you enjoy videos that follow your values like ours and you want to help us continue, uh, go to movieguide.org slash donate because we're actually a nonprofit. You may not know that, but we're working in Hollywood every day to help families have more choices that follows their values. And also subscribe right now.